close my eyes. I concentrate. It doesn't matter how many races you've won, how many rivals you've beaten. Your determination remains the same. It's a dialogue with the track, the rumbling, and the vibrations. Pushing it right to the limit, trying to understand if you can take yourself even further. Words like champion or legend lose their meaning if there's no will to set new goals. That is why, as I crossed the latest finish line, I already knew what my next challenge would be. I will find a rookie driver, the best of the bunch, one who is ready to push themselves even further beyond the limits. I was born in Haganou in Alsace, around 30 kilometers to the north of Strasbourg, a town with approximately 35,000 inhabitants. When I was young, my main hobby was gymnastics. I started gymnastics very young because my father was a coach. He taught at the Oberhofen Gymnastics Club. Oberhofen is a small village, but the club is at a very high level. He's still there, actually. From the age of about two or three, I started going to the club with my dad. So, because I was often with him anyway, I started at the gymnastics school. All my mates from the village also went to gymnastics classes. It was the main sport in the village. My passion for cars and speed came about quite naturally. It came of its own accord. It started with bikes. I really loved skidding on bikes when I was a kid. Then it moved on to scooters, where I was always having to race with my mates and show them that I was the one with the best scooter skills. Then I had my first cars. It was the same principle. I soon realized that I was more gifted than most of my friends, and I got an incredible feeling from it. Where I come from, it wasn't even possible to ever imagine I could become a professional driver, world champion, etc. It's not something you plan. I started out in motorsports at the age of 22 with my very first rallies. I never had enough money to buy my own cart for go-karting, so I took part in an event called Youth Rally. For me, at that time, this was my only way in if I ever wanted to turn pro. This event is held in locations throughout France. Back then, the selections were made by the Federation and Peugeot. You joined by paying a 15 euro subscription fee, and then the best drivers from each region were selected to go to the nationals. The two winners in the national final won a rally season pass. In my first year, I came ahead of 15,000 other participants. But for various reasons, I ended up not being selected. I entered the event the following year, where I dominated the regional selections and the national final, but was pulled up for a fort in the last heat. But following that competition, Dominique Hines contacted me, set up a meeting, and offered to help me start out in rallying. He bought a 106 Group N with his partner and their association. This allowed me to make my competition debut. My first race was a regional competition in Alsace with this car and Dominic Hines was my co-driver. He explained how rally driving worked because I didn't know very much about it. First ever time and we won our category in that first race. It flew by, but I still remember it to this day. It was a long time ago, back in 1997, but I have memories of that race I'll never forget. I met Danielle in 1997, when I was driving a 106 in France. He was co-driving for another driver in the same formula, so that's how we met. And then his driver retired at the end of that season, and my co-driver was scared and wanted to stop too. We got on well. We already knew each other. We'd had a night out after a rally in Sevin, and so we said, 
Well, why not? It might be nice to work together. We got on. We had a good time. And that's how it happened. Just having a drink one night. In 1998, I participated in a competition called the Saxo Kick Car Trophy, which is, without a doubt, one of the highest standard competitions in France. Real racing cars enter. A kick car is already a high-performance vehicle, so this is where the driver makes all the difference. It was here that I managed to get spotted, because I was neck and neck with experienced Formula racing drivers, Citroën drivers, most of whom were older than me. To be the youngest driver there, competing alongside them, often in the lead, for me, it was a major moment in my career. The people who were supporting me had invested a lot, and one day I came off the road. The car was insured, it was repaired, etc. Before the next race, we did a little test run, and I bust up the car again but it wasn't insured for test runs. There was a lot of damage, a lot of money to be invested for repairs. We didn't have the money, I didn't have it, and those supporting me didn't either. For me, it was the end of my career. I thought that it would all stop there. We couldn't enter the following races, but then we got a sponsor who helped get the vehicle back up to scratch. I won the last few races, there were cash prizes for positions, and that's how we got back on track. But it was a really difficult time. I was a young French driver, climbing up in the rallying world. I'd started to dream big, and then it all came to a sudden end. It was a touch-and-go moment. 1999 was the year it all came together. I dominated the championship. In fact, I won it, so I have really fond memories of that time. It was also at this point that Citroën started to take note that I was there, that I was an up-and-coming young driver who no doubt had some potential. It was from here on that Citroën started to become more and more interested in me. In 1999 was also the first year I entered the World Championship. I was selected for the French team, which meant I could enter five races in the World Championship. Two on dirt roads, just to learn the ropes, in Finland and England, and three on asphalt, the Corsica Rally, the Spanish Rally, and the San Remo Rally in Italy. That was also with a Saxo kit car. I was in a category which gave me the chance to meet other young drivers from across the world. My driving was now being talked about on the international scene. In 1999, I won the Saxo Trophy. The people who were helping me at the time decided to sell the car. We won and the car was sold. We didn't really know where to head the next season. Thanks to the support of a partner, we decided to go for the French Dirt Rally, which the media takes less of an interest in than the French Asphalt Rally. There wasn't really any official involvement of the manufacturers in this championship. However, in preparation for the World Rally Championship, it was essential to be able to prove I was capable of high speeds on dirt roads too. We entered and I did the first race. Back then we only had the budget for one race. And I won it. It was from then on that Citroën said I should continue. They helped me out a little bit to enter the second race, and I won again. The programme became semi-official, and Citroën was now a partner. They took over the management of the financial side of the programme. I wasn't paid to drive, but I knew that I could drive without worrying too much about where to find the money. So, that year, I won the French Dirt Rally Championship. As a kind of reward, Citroën let me go for the last heat in the French Asphalt Rally Championship, the one with the most media attention, the real French Rally Championship. They gave me the car for this heat, and I won the race. This particular French Championship Asphalt heat was the first time I was ever paid to drive. It was at the end of the French Championship in 2000. 
things started to change. In 2000, I also raced in two heats of the World Championship, still with the backing of the Federation. This time, for the WRC, I had a car that was up in amongst the top 10 vehicles. It wasn't a manufactured car, but I was able to compete and finished ninth and sixth, I believe, in the WRC. 2001 was definitely the most important year in my career. Alongside the French Championship, Daniel and I were also entered into the Junior World Championship with a Saxo for Citroën. It was a semi-official program, but we found ourselves up against young drivers from across the world who were there to try and get noticed and break into rallying. We dominated the program and won it too. Following these great results, at the end of the year, Guy Freclin decided to give me the official WRC Xara for a World Championship heat. Citroën were progressively making their way towards the WRC. They were getting ready. They had two official drivers and gave me a third car. It was a revelation, the turning point in my career. I finished ahead of the two other drivers and only 11 seconds behind the winner. This was my first event as an official driver and a trigger for me. All the manufacturers called me. Mitsubishi, Subaru, those participating at championship level at the time and those I'd tried to make moves towards for trials in the past. I'd never had answers from them before, but that day they called me. Everyone offered me official driver contracts with durations over several years. I decided to stay loyal though, to stay with Citroën, who'd got me that far. I think it was the right choice. At the beginning of 2000, I couldn't have imagined that in 2001, I'd have been an official Citroën driver. It all happened very quickly. I could never really have anticipated it. I discovered a great big world out there, a much bigger world than when I was driving in the French Championship. It meant I had to be capable of improvising a lot, of adapting to all sorts of situations. The difference when you're part of an official team is that you don't have to struggle to find money. You're paid to drive. That changes a lot. On the one hand, you're free from the pressure of having to say to yourself, what if I wreck the car? What will happen? Will I be able to rebuild it? That pressure is no longer there. However, there's another kind of pressure. You're racing for a manufacturer, and they want to see results. The make is behind the driver. That's where the pressure lies. There's also the pressure at this level, which is perhaps stronger than the pressure you have on you at an amateur level, where you drive for pleasure and calculate risks. Here, you have to go in for the fight, give the best of yourself if you want to win. The WRC Xara was a 4x4, more up-to-date than the Corolla I'd used in previous races. These cars are easier to drive for me, as long as you learn how to manage the skid and how you can play with the car. They're better in terms of front-wheel traction. I quickly got used to the vehicle and felt at ease driving it. What was difficult was knowing how to push it to its limits, because when you're in the WRC, you need to know the limits, because that's where everyone else is. That side of things is very difficult, but driving the car itself, I learned how to do that pretty quickly. In 2003, at the beginning of the season, there was a lot of pressure on me because it was my first full season in the World Championship, and two major figures had joined the team, Carlos Sainz and Colin McRae who were two global rallying leaders and would be driving with me with the same car. I was up against the best and had no excuses. If I managed to get up to their level, or not far from it, that would be amazing. If I was one minute off them in the specials, it would have been very complicated. 
In the first rally, we managed a triple in Monte Carlo. I finished ahead of my two teammates, so it was a dream start to the season for me. I saw it coming because I really knew what I was doing on asphalt. But I had no worries. However, the first dirt races were coming up and I felt the pressure there. And I remember my first dirt rallies with them, where from the outset I was at the same pace as them, even ahead. It was a relief. And from then on, I told myself that there was no reason I couldn't be the world champion one day. In the last race, I was in a position to go for the championship title, but finally got instructions from Citroën not to go for it. In this context, it was the first year where Citroën could have won the manufacturer title, and I could have won the driving title. My teammates soon found themselves out of the race. I can't exactly remember why. So if I got overall second place, Citroën would win the manufacturer title, and if I won, we take both titles. I was heading up the race, on track to winning both titles, and I was told to go for second place. We can't risk losing everything. Get second place to guarantee the manufacturer's title. And so I had to sacrifice my driver's title. We played the game. After all that, I missed the title by one point, but the event allowed me to gain experience and taught me that every point counts. Don't leave anything to chance. All the wins, all the points you can win, take them immediately, because we don't know how things will turn out at the end of the year. This perhaps changed how I took seasons on, and maybe in a positive way too. But it's true that at the time, 2003, wasn't easy. Before taking on the 2004 season, following what had happened in 2003, my state of mind was rather aggressive. I told myself that I couldn't drop a single point. We'd lost the WRC title by one point. It couldn't happen again. I participated aggressively in the championship and we found ourselves in the lead fairly quickly and in a position to take the title in Corsica. When you win the World Rally Championship for the first time in your life, it really is a dream come true. It's an incredible moment. I remember the end of the first special stage where all my nearest and dearest were waiting with champagne. My family and friends were at the finish line to encourage us and celebrate with us. It was an incredible time. Working with Citroën has always been a pleasure for me. We've built everything together because we arrived at the WRC together. We climbed the ranks together. And I think I brought in 90% of the wins. We've complemented each other well and being able to build my career with Citroën, a French manufacturer, has been the best. I think I started out 2005 with less pressure on me than in 2004. I had my title, I'd been the world champion. Anything else was a bonus. We wanted things to take shape, but it relieved me of a certain amount of pressure. And I think in the end, that was what made me stronger. It's true that 2005 was a year in which we really dominated. It wasn't a year in which we had to fight intensely. We had a very good car. I felt excellent driving it, at the top of my game. We really managed to set ourselves apart. I think that during that season, we had the advantage with our tyres compared to the Pirelli ones. My main competitor at the time, Marcus Bronholm, was with Pirelli instead. So I found myself in situations that were a a lot less complicated than in previous years. At the end of 2005, Citroën announced that they wouldn't officially be participating in the 2006 WRC. I started to look to other manufacturers. What could I do? What did my future hold? Guy Fraclin, the director of Citroën Sport at the time, didn't just want to let me go into the wilderness because he wanted to encourage Citroën to enter again the following year. He found a solution. 
I was kept on as a paid driver, but the car was used by a private team, Kronos, from Belgium. Kronos did a great job. We won the championship together. I also have some great memories of that year. It was a year of discoveries. I discovered a new team, a new car. That was the only year my car was blue. I had a lot of fun with some great people. In 2006, with Kronos, we were still at the top of our performance level, like we had been in 2005. Except that four rallies before the end, I had a little bicycle accident. Actually, a motorbike accident. I broke the top of my humerus bone and couldn't take part in the final rallies of the season. Rehabilitation was far from fun, quite complicated and quite heavy going. At the time, every win got you 10 points. When I'd broken my arm, there were four races left and I had a 36 point lead. So if Gronholm won all four races, he would become the world champion. But Gronholm came off the road on one course. It was a weird way to win the title, with someone waking you up on the phone while you're at home to tell you you're the world champion. It was quite a unique thing to experience, but also a great moment. In 2007 was the beginning of a new adventure because we changed car. We went with a C4 WRC. For me, this was the first time I was involved in the development of a car from scratch. I was the number one team member, and so it was up to me to build up the car to its best potential with the engineers and the rest of the team. But it all rested on my shoulders a little. It was something new for me, and when Danielle and I went in the car for the first time, we said to each other that it was the end of the WRC titles for us that we'd never manage it in that car. In terms of the handling, it was very different from the Xara. The Xara was more compact, more fast paced. With the C4, we found ourselves positioned a lot further back in the car. The car seemed a lot heavier to drive, a lot less manageable. We had to work really hard to try to free it up and make it perform better. We never managed to turn it into a car like the Xara, but its long wheelbase, for example, gave it other advantages. The car wasn't very light, but it was very stable. The C4 was back when we'd just started to explore new technologies, ABS, anti-skid systems, lots of extras to help with performance. In the end, we realized that most of the work was in fact the driver. The driver makes all the difference. It's better to concentrate on the driving itself than these types of things. So Citroën returned to the WRC with the C4 in 2007. I rejoined the official team at that point. I'd missed four rallies because of my arm. And even at Monte Carlo, I was still in a lot of pain with it. But we came in with a win, and this put everyone on the right track again. We started out in style, and it was another great season for us. I had four titles, like Mackinen and Cancunen, but it didn't change anything in the way I tackled the following races. I wasn't there to collect or count titles. At that time, I was driving because it was my passion, because I loved it. Obviously, I was motivated, I wanted to win. But breaking the record in terms of titles, that wasn't my priority. It didn't influence my way of doing things at all. The 2009 season was pretty busy and quite complicated. Red Bull, a partner back then, offered me a gift following my 2008 title win to go for a Formula One test run. I drove on the Barcelona circuit in an official session with other teams and drivers. 
on the day I drove, I got the eighth best time, and it got me thinking. In the end, Red Bull planned to put me in F1 at the end of the season, at the same time as my rallying. Seeing as the physical requirements for F1 are different, I started doing a lot of sport. I really tried to optimize that side of things. And also, this season hadn't gone as well as others. I'd come off the road. In the next rally, a mechanical failure forced me to give up the race. In the next rally, I got a puncture. The lead I had in the championship was lost all of a sudden, and we found ourselves in a difficult position. So, from that point, we decided, with the agreement of Red Bull, to focus on the rallies, not to mix everything up. To stop with all the sport and exercising and the F1 dreams. We met our main objective and won the title by one point. I don't know if all that had anything to do with it, but it felt like a very busy season that year. The 2010 Alsace Rally was one of my most memorable ever. I was back in my region for the first time. The last special was in Agano, where I was born. That year, I won the rally, which meant that not only did I get my title, but the manufacturer's title too. And it all happened in my hometown. The podium was in front of the town hall. All my friends and family were around me. It was incredibly emotional and without a doubt, one of my best memories. Alongside Corsica, where I'd won the first title of my career. In 2011, we started with the DS3. It was Citroën who, because of the development of the market and their marketing plans in general, decided to go with a more recent, more modern car. It corresponded with a change in the rules. The new 1600 engines and the banning of 2-litre engines. After a few days of driving, it was a real pleasure to drive the car compared with the C4. This car was a lot lighter and reacted better. We could throw it from left to right, exactly as we wanted. And we quickly understood that it was a lot more effective than the C4. In this range, out of the three, the DS3 is my favorite when it comes to handling and driving. We started out the season in the DS3. We hoped to make it work, to do what we'd done with the C4, that is, win the first season. The feeling we'd got on the test runs wasn't bad. We were motivated and positive for the season ahead. The changes in rules to reduce engine sizes to 1600 instead of two liters did nothing in terms of danger levels. We went just as fast as ever in the specials, and our times didn't change. We continued to improve our times in the specials, even with the 1600. The car performed just as well as the others. I think it was more a question of cubic capacity within the different championships, a question of budgets rather than safety. As a driver, nothing had changed. After the results I've had, after nine titles, of course I'm satisfied. Especially because they were back-to-back -back wins and I never skipped a year. I'm happy and proud of what I've achieved. When I decided to retire from rallying, I've been thinking about it for some time. It's not a decision you make from one day to the next. I knew that as my career went on, I couldn't continue to win consecutive titles it would have to come to an end. Finally, an opportunity came up to go for the WTCC with Citroën. I soon understood that I wasn't someone who could sit around doing nothing. I wanted to be in the driving seat and not roadside managing a team. After a 10-year career as world champion, even though rally driving is about as unrepetitive as it gets, it still does become a little repetitive. There's the notion of danger and the question of, is there anything left for me to prove? Which leads you to understanding when it's time. It was important for me that I was still young enough to be able to go and do something else. I wanted to stop, and I know that I was launching myself into something else I liked and which motivated me, WTCC. I'm in top shape. I can do this. I'm ready for it. 
It means I can get over rallying a little bit, because retiring from rallying without having anything to take its place is difficult. Of course, I knew all about Pike's peak before going, particularly the performance of the Vatanen team with the 405. I can remember some legendary moments. Doubtless, it's the most mythical coastal road out there. It was something I'd thought about. I'd already said to myself, one day, why not? It could be great. So when Peugeot offered me the chance to do it in a manufacturer-prepared car, a real one, with the objective of beating the record over there, I just couldn't resist the temptation. Pike's Peak was not what I'd been used to when rallying, because the road and the location are so completely different. And driving that type of car is also something totally different. I had an 800 kilo, 800 HP car. It was nothing like what I'd normally driven. It had a lot of grip. And to manage to drive something like that, on a road and not on a circuit, is a very specific type of exercise. What do I remember most about the race? It was the feelings I got that you don't get anywhere else. I think that to perform well as a driver there, you've got to have circuit and rallying experience. Knowing how to drive a car that sticks to the ground through aero thrust is learned on the circuits. Knowing how to tackle 20 kilometers of road, having learned the turns by heart, that comes from rally driving. Knowing how to manage the related risks, which a circuit driver isn't necessarily used to. It was as if this course was meant for me. I derived enormous pleasure from it. I thought the car was incredible the first time I saw it. It looked like a monster with a huge fin sticking out and a big front end strip. It was a good look on the whole. I couldn't wait to get behind the wheel. It makes such a racket when you start the engine. You have to block your ears. It's a beast of a car. I didn't take part in its construction, of course, but I took part in the first trials, helped to set the right parameters so that it was really drivable. One of the difficulties with Pike's Peak, given the fact that you have such a monster of a car, is that the car has to be drivable. I was a bit worried about it. I was scared I wouldn't get the right feeling in the car, that I'd find myself in something too brutal, with limits I wouldn't be able to control. In the end, it wasn't the case. It was somewhat like that at the beginning, but through development, by working on it, it ended up reminding me of the sensations I got from my rallying cars. For me, the climb can be split into three parts. The first section is quite rhythmic, with the tree-lined road, and then the vegetation changes with the altitude. What's really exhilarating is that sometimes, on bends, you can only see the sky. You can't see anything underneath you. You don't know what's there. It can drain you. But then, just don't ask yourself too many questions. If you see nothing, that's where the slope is. Up there in a car like that, such sensations are pretty impressive. Seeing nothing but sky on a bend. It's an incredible road on which you can really make the most of these types of cars. You don't often experience roads like this one.